Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Again, we thank God tonight for blessing us just to make it back to the Issachar Hour with me, Timothy Fleming Jr. Uh, thank you all for tuning in tonight as we get ready to get started uh, with our t with tonight's Bible study. Uh, like I always do, and I always encourage uh, for those that are tuning in, if the word has been a blessing to you and you know it's uh, definitely uh uh, impact that your life, then I know it's going to also bless other people. So I certainly encourage you to share uh, so that others can tune in tonight as well and be a part of tonight's Bible study. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and get started uh, at this time <clears throat> and pick up tonight uh, with where we left off on last week. Before I get started, say one quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your, uh, just all that you are doing and all that you're getting ready to do, God. And tonight we just dedicate uh, just this moment right now to you, God, that you may speak to us, just pour into us, Lord, uh, enlighten us, God, and just have your way on the inside of us tonight. And we just thank you right now as we invite your presence in, Holy Spirit, and we just thank you for the download of revelation tonight, revelation that can shift our lives, transform our circumstances, and enable us to walk in your divine promises and will for our lives. We just thank you right now for what you're doing and what you're getting ready to do, and we thank you for the blood covering us right now that no distractions in the name of Jesus. For we thank you, Lord, that your word shall accomplish that which it, it is sent out to do. And we praise you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and get started uh, at this time. We've been talking now for a couple of a couple of weeks now dealing with the topic of, of casting down evil altars evil altars. And tonight is part three uh, in this teaching on casting down evil altars. This is still a part of a larger body, a larger work that we've been, a uh, series that we've been going through, uh, talking about the two kingdoms. Uh, the, well, for maybe about two years, we dealt with uh, the kingdom of God, uh, just talking about faith and talking about prayer and just really looking at angels and just looking at everything that that pertains to the kingdom of God. And really, to be honest, there's still a lot more uh, to be discussed about the kingdom of God as well. Uh, but we spent uh, somewhere around maybe a two year period just discussing and talking about the kingdom of God. And then we segued into a teaching on the kingdom of darkness. So the two kingdoms, one being the kingdom of God or the kingdom of light, as some people call it, and the other being the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of Satan, uh, as, as we know it as. So uh, just looking at those two kingdoms and what the Bible says about them in this, uh, this topic or series that we are teaching on, uh, just exposing the kingdom of darkness, it helps us in our prayers. It helps us to fight the Christian fight and walk the Christian walk or run the Christian race, you know, as Paul described it. It helps us to understand our enemy and understand what kind of things we're up against. Um, like I uh, shared this a couple of weeks ago, I was reading a book entitled uh, Seeing Beyond. And uh, the in the preface of the book, a uh, young woman, she's a prophetess, she wrote the preface and she just shared a vision that God gave her of two demons that were in a boxing ring. And there was a crowd around, uh, but these demons were in the ring and somehow in the dream she could sense that the crowd was uh, comprised of Christians. Uh, but she said she saw the demons and God allowed her in the vision to see the robes the demons were wearing. And they had the gloves on. They were dancing around the ring like Muhammad Ali. But on the back of their robes, they had their names. And the first demon, its name was It's Just. I-T-S, you know, uh, uh, It's Just, J-U-S-T. And the other demon, uh, the back of his robe, his name was Life. And those two demons put together spell the phrase, it's just life. And she said a lot of Christians just accept things that are actually 
demonic attacks that are coming against them. But they don't see that as a demonic attack because they've been told it's just life. So they just deal with it. And because they take that nonchalant attitude, oh, it's just life. You know, everything hit me at one time. It's just life. You know, the car break down. Suddenly I'm in the hospital sick. Now I got doctor's bills and then all the kids acting up. You know, they just teenagers. And, oh, and then this is my marriage is going through. You know, it's just life. You know, uh, everybody now, you know, acting funny. And, and, and you know, oh, they just laying it. Oh, it's just life. no. Uh, you know, if you don't know when you are under demonic attack, then you won't know to pray against that attack. And there's a reason why Jesus told us again in the Ma gospel of Matthew, he said, I gave you the keys of the kingdom that what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And that binding and loosing, those are legal terms in Jewish culture that refers to what you prohibit uh, on earth heaven will co-sign and prohibit it or back you and what you permit, uh, what you lose or what you permit or allow to occur, heaven will also back you. So we're sitting back like, God, why won't you step in? And God is like, I gave you the authority to decide what you're going to allow or disallow in your life. And if you don't want the enemy to just wreak havoc and have his way, then you have to take authority over the enemy and take authority over what he's doing. And you do so through prayer and by trusting God, yielding to the spirit of God and following his voice. But because a lot of Christians don't know this, they just accept whatever happens. And I heard it said before that the devil... He will prefer that you don't believe he exists because you will never fight an enemy you don't think exists. You will never face a challenge that you think doesn't uh, pose a threat to you. So the enemy loves to mask his presence, uh, you know, uh, beneath the cloak of oblivion, oblivion and, and make us think that, oh, the devil isn't real or the devil isn't involved or this has nothing to do with the devil. You know, this is just life. When really that is a demonic attack coming against you and you're allowing it because you don't recognize that this is the work of the enemy. So we are talking about the kingdom of darkness so that Paul, like he said in First Corinthians, I think it's chapter 11, uh, that, you know, I will not have you be ignorant concerning Satan's devices, his schemes and tactics so that he can't take advantage of you. And if I don't know, then the devil will take advantage of me. And there are a lot of things, amen, that we really need to cover and discuss. Uh, but I want to just dive in and just uh, kind of uh, pick up on where we left off on last week. We were talking about, again, uh, the altars. And I explained how, yes, the Old Testament system, as far as there being a temple and an altar, you know, the brazen altar, all of that stuff is done away with. It's done away with. You don't need to go to a physical altar and kill a physical animal and, you know, sacrifice it on the altar to be forgiven of your sins. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. He took care of all of that. His death on the cross sealed the deal. So you no longer need to shed the blood of bulls and goats. The Bible declares in Hebrews chapter nine that the blood of Jesus is perfect and it has cleansed us from our sins. So his blood is the only blood that needed to be shed. But I explain how, yes, in a spiritual sense, we still do have an altar. And that comes from Hebrews chapter 13. We have an altar in our hearts upon which men cannot offer sacrifices, meaning the Levites and the priests. They can't operate, amen, or offer sacrifices upon the altar of our hearts because they can't get to our hearts. Only God can. And we have an altar in our heart. And then I explain how, yes, there's still a temple. God still has a temple. We, our bodies, are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible declares. So God still has a temple, our bodies, and he still has an altar, our hearts. And he still has a priesthood. Peter said, we are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. So we are priests. 
We have a temple, which is our bodies. We have an altar, which is our hearts. And we are to offer a sacrifice to God daily. And that sacrifice, Romans chapter 12, verse number one, is to give yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. Amen. So that means we are to give ourselves over to God on a daily basis as a living sacrifice. And not only that, but Hebrews 13, to give God a sacrifice of praise with the fruit of our lips. So we are supposed to, we got a temple, we have an altar, we are priests, and we are supposed to give God a sacrifice of ourselves and to give God worship and praise on a daily, on a daily basis. Amen. So yeah, in the physical sense, that old system, ceremonial system is done away with, but spiritually it still applies, amen, to us as believers. So we dealt with that and then kind of moved a little bit uh, into the direction of, of discussing different altars. And I brought up on, and I, and I want to, I, I brought up on last week, and I just want to kind of bring this up again, um, a living example. I'm going to read this verse and this uh, should have had it on the screen, but if you have note taking notes, you can write this down. But first Samuel chapter, chapter five, uh, starting at verse number one, I want to read this story to you out of the Bible. And this was the story of, of when the Israelites went to war with the Philistines uh, and, and the Philistines ended up capturing the Ark of the Covenant and taking it back to their temple. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1, uh, after the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Uh, they, then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple. That was the Philistines' God, Dagon. They carried it into Dagon's temple and set it beside their statue, their idol god named Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they arose, there was Dagon again falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. So I bring that scripture up because I was sharing with you on last week how you can, even though we don't have to build a physical ark, uh, I mean altar, I'm sorry, you can still take a, a space of, uh, you know, a territory and dedicate it unto God. And I, you know, I shared how uh, Jesus told us, go into your prayer closet. It doesn't mean a literal storage closet or a clothing closet, but he means to go into a, a secret place where you can just be alone with God, wherever that is. You know, I used to get up and go and, and just sit in my car, go and get in the garage and sit in the car and play worship music and turn that into my place to pray and meet with God. And I love, I just love to get in the car and drive out to this park. Is this park close by my house? And hardly no one is ever there. I mean, it's just, you know, trees way out in the woods, you know, and I just go and drive there and just park the car and sit there and just use that time and just spend time with God. I just like getting away, you know, and going, you know, sometimes being in the house feel a little cramp. So I like to get out and go to certain places uh, that, that I feel comfortable in. And God will meet you. Amen. He will certainly meet you because you have designated that time to him. And God is fully aware of the fact that you got a work schedule, the fact that you got to go from 10 to, to 6 or 9 to 5. He's fully aware of everything that is on your plate. He made you and he knows you better than you know yourself. So when he tells you to, to cut aside or carve out time for him, amen, then that is something that he holds special to his heart because he knows that is a real genuine sacrifice. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, Amen. Chapter 11 is saying God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after 
him. Amen. So God sees you pursuing him. Guess what he does? He rewards you for pursuing after him. Glory to God. So it's biblical to just get up and take time and just find some place that you can go. Uh, but, you know, even as we shared, even you can walk around your classroom as a teacher and just pray all over that classroom and you will set a different atmosphere. You can walk around your cubicle or office or whatever when other people aren't there and you can just pray and set a different atmosphere. And when you do this, you'll create an atmosphere that makes it hard for the enemy to operate in. Yeah, the devil may try to buck and, you know, everything, but you will create and set an atmosphere where God and the angels of the Lord can reside and operate. And I was sharing on last week how when my wife and I, we were uh, opening up our office space on last year. Uh, you know, while it was still in construction, it, you know, we would just walk all around that office place, stepping over nails, stepping over, you know, all kind of stuff and just walking all around. And we would just pray all over the, the office, just pray all over, pray all over the walls, pray all over, the, you know, every inch of that that space, uh, just walking and praying and praying in the spirit and just covering that office and dedicating it unto God, just dedicating it to God. And I shared this with you how during that time, you know, we had different people that were coming in, a lot of different people that were coming in uh, just to kind of help decorate and, and, and do little things. Uh, and there was one individual that came in and they were, they they brought, you know, some different decorations to make everything look great in office, but they brought in a little bitty uh, elephant statue. And, you know, we prayed all over this office and we said, God, this is your office. This is your business this is your office. We dedicate it to you. Hey, man, it's so important that you dedicate your house to God that you get anointing oil, walk all around your house and anoint the doors and anoint the windows. Uh, if you got a car, pray all over your car, get your oil and just, you know, all over your car. Don't pour it all on the dashboard or nothing, but, you know, just go and anoint your car and say, hey, I dedicate this car to you, God, trust me. You, you you will feel a whole lot better knowing that this is dedicated to the Lord and the Lord uh, has supreme reign in that environment. But it's so important that you create an environment. Don't just let, let the devil walk in and just wreak havoc and have his way. No, you decide to create an environment. Now, am I saying that everything's going to be perfect? Of course not. We're still human. You know, we still get emotional. Things still happen. But when you invite God in, you the spirit of God can begin to bring conviction where it's needed. He can begin to work in that atmosphere and prevent things from a, from happening that would happen had God not been there. So it's so important that you create an atmosphere by dedicating whatever that space is that you're in, your house, your workspace, your car, uh, dedicate uh, your body. Amen. Uh, isn't it interesting to get up if you're dealing with a sickness, just declare, Lord, I dedicate my body. My body is your temple. That tells the devil something. It gives a message to the enemy that, hold up, you're putting your hands on something that is holy, which means you're operating uh, illegally. You touch not God's anointed and do his prophets no harm. Amen. Uh, I remember when I was 11 years old, I prayed that prayer. I dedicate my mind to you, God. And when I prayed that prayer, all of my nightmares ceased. I dedicate my mind to you and I cover my mind with the blood of Jesus. And nightmares I had for months instantly went away. Instantly. Because I was under demonic attack. So it's so important that you just, you utter those words. Lord, I dedicate this. I dedicate my life to you. I dedicate my body to you. Because sometimes we'll say to God, Lord, I give you my life, but then we'll withhold certain aspects of our lives from God rather than releasing everything over to him. 
You know, I dedicate, uh, give you my time on Sunday morning. I just don't give you my time on Monday. It, uh, it, it doesn't work that way. God desires to be the Lord of all at all times. Uh, but I want to show you this. I want to show you this. I was explaining again how we dedicated our office to God. And this person, they came in and brought this little statue and they didn't know. They, they, they did it out of ignorance. They didn't know because you have to look real closely to see what was on the statue. Let me go ahead and play this for you. All right. So. I just need to document this right quick, get into the office today. And I noticed that uh, when I walked in, uh, the decoration crew, they made you know some new changes and additions. I mean, got it looking awesome in here. Of course, we're gonna put the big book up on the wall. And they put a couple of things around, but notice here on the floor, there's something that happened. There were two things that were on the floor, a mirror, and a uh, and a little elephant. When I walked in, all of this was on the floor, busted up. And apparently, they were trying to hang the mirror up here on the wall. And the mirror must have failed when they were trying to connect it, hang it. It must have failed, and they had the little elephant thing right there next to the 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 Bible verse thing. The mirror must have failed and knocked the elephant thing on the ground and busted it up. And of course you can see here on the side with the mirror where it fell and, and got busted. Uh, now remember, this is a Christian establishment. We even prayed and spoken tongues and walked all over this place praying in the spirit. And this is God's, this is God's house. This is God's business. So lo and behold, there's a <laughs> <laughs> There's a supernatural explanation for why that mirror fell on top of this elephant, knocked the elephant on the ground, busting it wide open. And I'm going to show you right here. This is what I saw when I walked in, put my key in and opened up the building, walked in. Look very closely right there. and You see a Hindu deity of an elephant, <laughs> a Hindu deity. And they didn't know the decoration crew. They were just looking at stuff and finding whatever looked best and what was, you know, just, uh, you know, whatever was, uh, you know, that would just go well with decorations. But right there in the center, you see a, a, a little elephant god right here. Elephant god. That's a Hindu god. You know, Hinduism, they have over 350 million gods. And one of their gods is an elephant god. And so you can see it right there, the legs folded, the tuck, the tusk, you know, trunk uh, in one hand up and another hand holding something. And this Hindu deity does not belong in the house of God, a place that is dedicated to God, to the Holy Spirit. So there was an idol that was being placed right here in our midst. And it's so funny because God... And that's why I say I don't believe in coincidence and accident. The mirror that was hanging on the wall fell off of those little hinges, sticky things right there, fell on top of this elephant, knocked the elephant off of the top right here, knocked it off, and caused it to fall right on the ground and bust, bust into pieces. And of course, the mirror I'd set out the way over here. You can see the side where it got busted up. But God said, this is my house. You better not put an idol up in my house. And that's exactly what took place. Um, All right. I'm going to stop right there. Now, if you notice in the video, you saw that little uh, Bible verse, Jeremiah on it. It sits a lot taller than the elephant, a lot taller. Rational thinking and logic would dictate that when the mirror fell off the wall, it would fall on top of the Bible verse first and knock that over. In fact, it would knock that over before it even hits the elephant. The mirror somehow, this happened overnight with no one in the building. The mirror fell off the wall bypassed the Bible verse, which it was supposed to hit first, bypassed the Bible verse, hit the elephant and knocked 
it on the ground and the elephant was on the ground busted up alongside the mirror laying next to it, the Bible verse was still standing, hadn't been touched. I, glory to God, there's absolutely no way, no way that was supposed to happen or should have happened according to the laws of nature. <laughs> it was supposed that man was supposed to hit the Bible verse, knock that over, and then possibly knock the, the elephant over, uh, maybe, but it, that's not what happened. And that was something supernatural. And the reason I brought that up is, is it, it kind of parallels with the Bible verse that I read uh, just a moment ago. How when you put an idol uh, in the house of God, you know, either that idol idol is going to stand or, the, or God is going to stand. But God is never going to share space with an idol. And if you dedicate your, your, your space to God, trust, believe there are angels that are in that space. No, you can't see them. They are there. They are angels that are there. And, you know, the Bible does tell us we can't command the angels as we declare and speak the word of God. Sometimes angels sit around bored, (laughs) almost like they are unemployed, you know, just waiting for us to give them something to do uh, because we don't know how to exercise our authority and begin to give them assignments. You know, that's a whole nother teaching. But they're angels that are in that place that you have dedicated to God. Uh, We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, how you can, through the occult realm and practices, open up demonic portals where demons come in, the witch of Endor, who Saul consulted to contact the spirit of, of Samuel, said, oh, when she was doing a seance, I see gods ascending out of the earth. She opened a demonic portal. But as a believer, you can actually speak against that portal and command it to close and then declare, God, your kingdom come and your will be done in this atmosphere and open up the heavens over that particular area where you are. And that coincides with in the book of uh, Genesis, when Jacob saw the vision of an open heaven and a ladder ascending from heaven to earth. And he said he saw angels ascending and descending up and down that ladder. They kept coming almost like they were in shifts, you know, uh, coming back and forth to watch over where Jacob was. So you have that authority that, oh, right here, I declare open heaven. And you have that responsibility to make sure that that space remains free of idols and evil altars. Glory to God. Uh, So I wanted to show that video because that's, again, like I promised on last week, I wanted to uh, show you a visual of what actually took place uh, when my wife and I dedicated that space to God. So I want to turn back and go back and take a look at the slides because uh, we talked about, again, dedicating your your body to God, dedicating your space to God, uh, dedicating whatever possessions. Now, there's a rule here. You cannot anoint cursed objects. You can't bless cursed objects. I can't go buy a Ouija board and say, Lord, I dedicate this to you. The Bible calls that a a cursed object. Second Corinthians chapter six, uh, starting around verse number 14. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you again. Uh, Deuteronomy 18. Do not even consult with the the spirits of the dead or practice any of these uh, tools of divination and and sorcery and witchcraft for an abomination. So I can't pray over my charms and my uh, books of spells and incantations and say, Lord, I dedicate this to you. And I know that some people are saying, well, you know, that should be obvious. No, it's not. There are a lot of people today who practice what they call white magic and they just kind of indulge a little bit and dabble a little bit into a lot of these mind science, new age type of things. And they'll get up and say, well, you know what? It's the same as talking to the Holy Ghost. The Kundalini and the Holy Spirit are the same thing. You know, I I, I pray and read my Bible and I Uh, read my books or spells because all of it is for the good. They are literally trying to mix God with idols. 
uh, angels with demons. They are trying to mix righteousness with wickedness, and they are trying to anoint and even consecrate things that God called cursed and declared to be an abomination. You cannot do that. Amen. That's the reason why God said 2 Corinthians 6 again, uh, do not touch the unclean thing and I will receive you again. In fact, that's the reason why I want to highlight and emphasize this again in Exodus chapter 20, uh, where God gave the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, he said, do not have any other God beside me. But then he gave an explanation of uh, he, he explained, I am a jealous God. And what that means is that he is the only right that has the legal right to be possessive of us because he's the only one that made us. So he said, and, and through that expression, I'm a jealous God, he conveyed the message that I will not share my throne and my glory with any other God. I don't share. I don't share. Amen. You're not going to put me on the throne and put Allah on the throne at the same time. It's not going to work. Either I'm going to stay and that idol leaves or that idol stays and I leave, but we are not going to coexist. You know, that needs to be a message for us as believers because today a lot of people are falling for the lie that you know, what God desires is for all of us to just come together. You know what the Lord really wants? He really wants us to get along with everybody and just all of us put aside our differences. No, that ain't. God told us, Romans chapter 14, to love and even respect all men, including those that have a different opinion or belief system from up than us to respect them. In other words, don't come at them cruelly. Don't try to, you know, attack them and insult them or what have you. But yeah, hey, you know, I respect that's how you feel, but oh, I respect your viewpoint, but let me present my viewpoint. Amen. That's why people have to learn how, like Dr. King said, to disagree without being violently disagreeable. Amen. Glory to God. You can have a debate. You can have a conversation and share your, your your view and share yours without the two of you picking up guns or, or coming to blows. And when a person can't talk and they always get angry and they ready to attack you because your, your viewpoint is different, they don't operate under the spirit of God. That's the spirit of the world or the spirit of Satan. Amen. That's just anger and violence and defensiveness, which also indicates that they lo no longer have a point or valid point. So because they don't have a valid point, they have to attack you because they can't attack your argument. You know, so it just shows ignorance on their part. But, you know, you can have different views and everything. And, and Paul said that, 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 all right, we respect all men. However, Jesus warned us in Matthew chapter 10. He said, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring the sword. That if a man loves anyone or anything more than me, he is not worthy of me. And what he explained in that passage is that he did not come to bring world peace. Because as long as the world is standing against God, then the world cannot be in alignment with God. Amen. How can two walk together unless they are in agreement, the book of Amos declares. So that means in order for us to come together in unity, we have to actually be unified in our faith. Now, what Jesus prayed in the Gospel of John, the 16th chapter, was for the church to be unified. He did not ask for the Father to unify the church with the world. Because the world, according to Romans chapter 8, amen, stands in opposition towards God. For the carnal mind is enmity against God. James, the fourth chapter, James declared, Are ye adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So I can't stand for that the values and the things that the world embraces and still feel the love and acceptance of God strange from him because I'm trying my best
Thank you, Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Uh, we declare we come against every distraction. Amen. In the name of Jesus. So I can't continue to embrace the world and try to embrace God at the same time. Because if I do that, according to James chapter four, I am an adulterer. And the word adultery, by definition, it means to be married to one person, but cheating on them with someone else. So it goes back to what God says. I'm jealous. Amen. You mine. You my boo. What you doing hanging out with that God over there? Uh, -uh You mine. You know, you ain't supposed to be creeping around on me with some other idol. No, you belong to me. I made you. I'm, I'm your God. I'm your provider. And God gets, amen, he feels uh, rejected by those actions. So it's very important that we keep that perspective and keep that understanding uh, that God will not share uh, his his, his, he will not share your your heart with some other idol, and he won't share that space. You can't try to Christianize witchcraft. You can't sanctify uh, occultism. I'm sorry, amen. I know you, a glory to God, and I talk about this a lot, and I know I bring this group up, the Masons, and you know, a lot of times they'll say, well, we have a Christian chapter, but that is, you know, when you have an overall organization that tells you you're supposed to worship at every altar, at Baal and Mithra, you're supposed to bow before every altar, as Manly P. Hall put it, uh, and as I, uh, 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 as um, uh, 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 I, Albert uh, Pike, as he put it as well, you know, when you have that kind of an organization that is telling you, you're supposed to bow before every altar uh, because there's light that comes from every religion and you're not allowed to proselytize or share your faith with anyone else in the organization. Well, that's still, that's idolatry. And that's one of the reasons why you got to come out of things and come out from among people who are actively just worshiping idols and many times out of ignorance because they think that all paths lead to heaven. They think that all different names of God apply to the same being. They think that God and Baal and Mithra and Isis and Osiris and Horus and and, and, and uh, all of these other entities and all of the millions of entities, they think that all, Brahma and all that is all God. No, it's not. It's not all God. And you have to uh, come out of agreement with with these other other gods. Amen. If you're going to receive what God has for you. So let me put this again back on the screen as we talked about uh, the altars or evil altars, uh, an altar. Uh, uh, if a man creates an idol in God's house, God will cease to remain in that house. And that's according to Ezekiel chapter eight, verses five and six, which reads, then the Lord said unto me, and this is Ezekiel talking, son of man, lift up your eyes now uh, the way toward the south. So I lifted up my eyes uh, the way towards the north. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, towards the north. And I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. Uh, and God said furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel commit here, that I should look, go far, go far away from my own sanctuary. Uh, but turn ye yet again and see even greater abominations that the people are doing. So right here in Ezekiel chapter eight, God tells us, that the worshiping or bowing before all of these altars, erecting of all of these different altars to these idol gods, is going to cause me to leave my own house. It's going to cause me to leave my own sanctuary. Now, the devil doesn't have more power than God. So the devil can't walk in and tell God to get out. <laughs> oh, Lord, the, the, the God can thump the devil away. Amen. Just literally thump him away. You know, However, God cannot override your free your free will. He cannot force you to accept him and reject the enemy. So you actually hold the authority in this situation. You're the one that makes the decision whether or not God stays and the devil goes or Satan stays and God goes. And the way that you keep God is by rejecting the enemy 
and tossing all of the enemy stuff out of your place. And when you create an atmosphere that is comfortable for God, then God feels comfortable moving in because you have now officially invited him in. That is your responsibility. Amen. And that's why I always use this testimony to let people know, hey, uh, if you have anything in your house and the Holy Spirit is bringing it up to your mind, telling you, hey, you got to get this out of here. You got to toss that. You got to, you know, throw this out. You got to remove these things, get rid of certain books or get rid of certain items, certain things hanging up on your wall. I know it's supposed to, you know, commemorate uh, your travel experience and you being well cultured and oh, talk about your culture and, you know, and uh, I, I understand, I get it, but you do know that that stuff represents idols and rich craft and therefore you need to toss it. I understand it has a sentimental value, but don't allow a sentimental value to rob you of a divine promise. Get it out the way because you got too much in store from heaven to allow that stuff to cost you all of the promises and the blessings that God has for you. I mean, get rid of it. And trust me, once you get rid of it, you won't miss it anyway. Amen. Glory to God. And, and fill your house or fill that space with things that 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 glorify God. Amen. Begin to fill that space with things that glorify God, that invite the presence of God in. And I tell you all the time, uh, the thing that you do is you anoint that place with the oil of God. Have someone pray over that oil, anoint it. Amen. They, you know, uh, don't just sit the Bible on your on your mantelpiece or on your 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 dresser and just let it sit there and collect dust. Open it up and actually read it. Amen. It's not supposed to be a piece of furniture, but the important thing is that you get rid of the demonic items, occult items, uh, incantation spells, witchcraft, uh, sage, get rid of uh, incenses and all kind of different things that are supposed to represent some occultic way of acquiring power and cleansing negative energy. The Bible don't talk about cleansing negative energy by burning sage. No, it tells you to allow the presence of the Lord to come in. And where the presence of God is, there is liberty. But how do we enter into the presence of God? Definitely not by burning something in the house. Glory to God. If you're going to burn some, burn the toast, but don't be burning some incense and talking about this inviting the presence of God in. No, the way you invite God's presence in is you worship God. You surrender to God. You begin to glorify and magnify. The Bible say he inhabits the praises of his people and your praises like an incense unto the Lord. Amen. It is a sweet smelling fragrance that God, uh, he enjoys. Amen. You begin to worship and just begin to pray and glorify and magnify God. And don't, that's how you begin to invite God's presence in. Amen. Not by doing, you know, all of that other stuff that you see the world do it. So it's very important that we, we understand this. So let's, let's go back again uh, to our slide. As it tells us right here, uh, evil altars will block God's blessings. Uh, second paragraph, they will block God's blessings and God's favor in our lives. And this is according to Judges chapter 6, verses 24 and 25. And those verses read, Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah uh, of the Abyssalites. <laughs> uh, that same night, after Gideon built this altar to God, remember God showed up to Gideon while Gideon was in hiding and told him, you are a mighty man of bravery. I'm going to use you to deliver the people, the Israelites, from the hands of your enemies, the Midianites. And the Midianites were uh, taking up all of the grain, all of the food, starving the Israelites to death and oppressing them. And God said, Gideon, I'm going to use you as a deliverer. So Gideon built an altar to God, but then God followed up with this instruction. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, uh, the one seven years old, and tear down the, your father's altar to Baal. Cut it down 
cut down the Asherah pole beside it. So God gave Gideon this instruction. He said, I'm going to use you as a deliverer. I'm going to use you to set the people free. Isn't that a wonderful promise? I'm going to use you to set your family free. I'm going to use you to set your household free. Your children are going to get saved. Your aunties and uncles are going to come to the Lord. Your parents are going to surrender. I'm going to use you. I'm going to bring breakthrough and deliverance in your church. Your congregation is going to feel the weight and glory of my presence. I'm going to bestow my power and anointing on you like never before. I'm getting ready to do a new thing on the inside of you. I'm getting ready to break sickness off of you. I'm going to break the back of poverty. I'm getting ready to break strongholds. I'm about to uh, uh, just break every stronghold the enemy has placed on your lives that brings psychological disorders, that brings physical sickness and ailments. Some people, <laughs> you can go on a vacation for 50 days. Guess what? The problem is you take you with you. And that's what the real issue is, because this is still being tormented. The, the thinking that you operate is what keeps you trapped in a loop, a uh, destructive cycle. So I don't care how many days you go on vacation until this gets set free. So isn't it amazing to hear God say that? I'm getting ready to set you, the people free and I'm going to do it through you. But, but, but. The only way this is going to work, Gideon, is you have to go to your daddy's house and tear down his altar to Baal. I want you to destroy that altar to Baal. And then the Asher, Asherah pole, I want you to, to destroy that as well. You know, uh, interesting fact, again, I, and I know this is kind of beside the point just a little bit, but uh the 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 uh cultists who basically came and set up all of this Masonic imagery in the nation's capital, you know, with the obelisk and and setting up Washington DC like a giant pentagram with one side missing, which in the occult world symbolizes an entryway for Mephisto or Satan to enter into that uh city or town. I mean, they set up all of this satanic imagery. And then turned around and named the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., or the District of Columbia. And the goddess Columbia was the Greek goddess who was the female counterpart to the Babylonian goddess named Ashereth. So it's kind of like saying the district belonging to Ashereth. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making that up. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. Amen. But um, God told Gideon, I want you to go and cut down the Asherah pole. I want you to chop it down, burn it, get rid of it and destroy that altar that is dedicated to the God Baal. Because if you don't do that, then these idols, these altars will continue to allow, listen, allow the oppression of the enemy to reside in the land. They will keep me from doing what I want to do in the land and give access and permission to the enemy to continue to afflict and oppress you and destroy you because eventually y'all gonna die from starvation if y'all don't do something real fast. So God's strategy to Gideon was before victory can come, there's something you have to get out of your house. And in this case, before victory can come to the nation, you're going to have to make one of the most daring and boldest, uh, most challenging decisions you've ever made. You're going to have to go back to your father's house and destroy the family idols. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Now, that is something incredible uh, because, again, there are a lot of us that are suffering not because of our actions, but because of the actions of those who have come before us. And I mean suffering on so many levels. I, I, I will always continue and, 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 and uh, maintain this argument that every ailment, everything that we face as individuals uh, every struggle that we have today has started somewhere in our childhood. And it usually started with the way our parents treated us, the things they said or didn't say, the things they did or didn't do for us. Whether that parent abused you or neglected you, abused you through neglect, 
or whether that parent was emotionally unavailable or whether they showed unnatural affection towards you. Every All of these things had the effect of skewing your perspective of yourself and your perspective of life, of causing you to go through this world with either a damaged self-image, low self-esteem, a lack of confidence, shy, afraid, timid, unwilling to open up and express yourself, or calls you to be the kind of person that lashes out, defensive, aggressive, mean, rude, acrimonious, and everything else. All of it goes back to our childhood. Whether you walk in courage or with, with confidence, or you lack confidence, you know, because a parent refused to compliment you, but they overly criticized you. I mean, and now you go through life uh, uh, like you're walking on eggshells, afraid to upset somebody because you need everyone's approval and validation, uh, which is nothing but cold word for I didn't receive it from a parent's at home. I mean, everything goes back to that. And I'm not saying that everything, you know, uh, that all of our issues are, uh, is because of mom and daddy, but the majority of, of how we perceive ourselves in the world around us, it was established at home. And so there are a lot of things that <laughs> we wrestle with today because these things were passed down to us from the other generation. Now, let me stop and say this. Because you're not going to find any perfect people. You're not going to find perfect parents. You know, if I could say that, oh, well, uh, there's an actual, you know, group of people or individuals or whoever that actually made it into through this world and all the way to, you know, their old life or whatever without experiencing any trauma. You know, that would be a dishonest statement. All of us have experienced some kind of trauma. And even if you came up in a really good household, there was still some things lacking and some things missing. And in some cases, you experienced trauma from the outside, maybe bullying, maybe a molestation, you know, at school or something, you know, that may have occurred, amen, that really had a negative impact on your self-esteem and self-image. But most, and, and I say this most, most of what we deal with comes from the way we were raised, uh, comes from uh, another generation. And those are things that we have to go back and deal with uh, because I'm going to show you something. And I, I said I wanted to put this on the screen uh, of, of one way that altars were actually made, uh, one way that altars were made. Uh, but before I get there, let me explain this to you. When you're asking God to, to fix you, you have to be willing to take that trip. And I know that some people are like, no, nah, that is a waste of time and a waste of space. And here's the deal. If you don't know that you have been affected by a certain trauma or you have been traumatized, if you don't even know it, if you are not even aware of it, then you don't even know that it's still operating in your life subconsciously. You have no idea. And that's the reason why there are people walking around talking about this is just who I am. It's my personality. But your personality conflicts with scripture and with the fruit of the spirit. There are plenty of things, myself included, glory to God, <laughs> definitely myself included, that we all wrestle with and deal with, but the only way you actually gain mastery over it is to become aware of it. And if you were conceited, arrogant, high-minded, and you were just full of, <laughs> full of yourself, and you are full of pride and unwilling, you know, because look, a lot of people are afraid to look in the mirror at themselves. They are afraid. And it's because if you have faced criticism all your life and rejection, rejection hurts and stings. Emotions are not just some ethereal concepts floating around. No, these are physical substances that actually form, <laughs> a neurologist discovered that an emotion actually forms proteins in your body. And those proteins change your DNA structure. So that emotion that you're feeling is more than just a feeling. It is a physical substance that begins to physically transform your actual DNA. And that's the reason why when you're heartbroken, your chest hurts. 
A, sci a scientist discovered that when you suffer or feel the feeling of loneliness, it attacks your, your lungs and has the same effect as smoking several packs of cigarettes. <laughs> you know, different emotions actually attack different parts of your body. When you're stressed, a lot of people feel it in their stomach area. It begins to attack their gut and <laughs> as well as their chest. And, oh, it's hard for me to breathe. Uh, Glory to God, an emotion and your body, your brain is your brain is like, look, I never want to feel that again. I never want to experience that feeling again. The look on that person's face, the feeling of rejection that I felt when they looked at me that way or when they said that I never want to go through that again. And the brain builds a defense so that it operates in a state of denial. And and you know good and well you need to sit down with a counselor, but you like uh uh I'm I'm filled with the spirit head shake, and and the Holy Ghost was like I know you invited me in, but there's some places inside of you you won't even give me access to because you just like whitewashing it and just kind of brushing it under the rug when you know good and well I cannot heal the areas in your life you refuse to address. So I need you to sit down and take a real honest look at yourself and say, God, I know there's plenty of stuff you got to fix on the inside of me. Yes, God, he, 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 he develops the fruit of the spirit inside of us. Yes, but you forget what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10. You're supposed to cast down thoughts and imaginations. That word thought in the Greek also means a belief system, that there are inner beliefs you develop as a result of being molested, as a result of being neglected, as a result of your parents splitting up. Inner beliefs that said, I'm responsible for this. It's because of me. It's because, And from there came shame, which began to grow in you like a root. And the Bible warns us about certain roots. Don't allow a root of bitterness to spring up inside of you and cause many to be defiled. And there, there are some people that are caught in that, that the very destructive loop uh, because there's a root on the inside of them. And God knows it and he's trying to get, he's trying to address it, but you got to wall up. Don't want to let allow the Holy Spirit to take you there. And God will use other people, counselors, ministers that help take you there. They are not perfect. They are just vessels in that moment. They help you go to a dark place that God is trying to shine a light in. So oh, glory to God. Amen. So allow God to, to take you back. Allow him to take you deep and take you far into the, the the recesses and the dark crevices of your soul uh, so that he can begin to shine a light in the areas that you've been trying to avoid because you just don't want to feel that emotional pain anymore. But go ahead and face it. The Holy Ghost will give you an anesthesia so that you can face it. Go ahead and go there and face it and ask the Holy Spirit when you pray, all right, God, fix me. That's why the Bible say, if a man examines himself, he will not be judged. <laughs> he will not be judged by God. Let God begin to work on you and, and he'll begin to take the stuff out of you. Some of us think that, oh, the blood just, just radically just transform everything. If that was the case, why does the Bible say be renewed in the spirit of your mind or be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which means an active ongoing process? If everything just happened overnight, oh no. Yes, your spirit man got renewed, but your soul, which is where your intellect and your emotions, that part of you still has to undergo a process of transformation. Still got work to do. I want to bring this, this verse up. Well, we're really at the end of our time, so I'm not going to really be able to go into this. Uh, but there's a verse I'm going to get to, and it talks about uh, memories. 
talks about memory. <laughs> and, and this was fascinating as I was studying this and just looking at how altars were constructed because, you know, altar was constructed to commemorate a move of God in a certain area. You know, it was, uh, it was something that was a place where people went to to remember God and the works that he had done as well as worship God. And when we talk about altars in the spiritual sense, because, you know, you may be saying that, well, I don't have any altars. I ain't build no kind of altar. You know, I, I ain't build no altars. I, you don't see me sitting around putting a bunch of bricks together and, and then building an altar and putting a statue of Baphomet on top. <laughs> I understand. I understand. But you may still have an evil altar in your life <laughs> in here. And when we come back on next week, that's where we're going to pick up. That's where we're going to pick up. And we're going to talk about a certain type of altar that many of us as believers continue to construct and erect in our lives. And it's draining us and it's really destroying us. Amen. So we're going to talk about that on next week. Amen. So again, I pray tonight uh, that the word really enlightened and informed and blessed you. Amen. And let's go ahead and pray at this time. Father, we thank you right now just for uh, tonight, just for the teaching of the word right now. We thank you, Lord, for uh, just the revelation and understanding God uh, of the word of God right now. We thank you as, as your word teaches. You're not going to share the throne of our hearts with any other idol. Tonight, we denounce and we just get rid of every idol in our lives. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will speak to each and every person that is watching right now. Give us the discernment of spirits. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have given us the discernment of spirit. We receive it right now by faith. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that through the discernment of spirit, you thank you for pointing out to us every occult object or idol or, or altar that is dedicated to the enemy, all things that hinder your presence, pointed out to us uh, so that we may get rid of these things uh, in our lives, God. We want to create an open heaven in our homes, an open heaven on our jobs, an open heaven in our ministries, in our churches, in our lives, God. And we thank you right now, Lord, for each and every uh, move that you are performing. Give us the strength, the courage to walk in that which you have called us to do, to do that which you have called us to do, to make amends, to right the wrongs, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. To settle affairs with our neighbors, God. Give us that wisdom, that courage, and that strength, Lord, to do that which is pleasing in your sight. And God, we thank you right now, Lord Jesus. We get, we dedicate our minds to you, dedicate our bodies to you, dedicate our classrooms, houses, homes, cars. We dedicate everything to you. And we just give you free reign and we speak against every demonic altar and every demonic portal right now. And we command it right now to close up. And we thank you, Lord, as we get rid of everything out of our lives that is not like you, that we're going to feel your glory even greater. And we thank you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. 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 Again, I thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, like I say, I pray the word really bless and encourage someone. Uh, look, we never leave without giving those that are tuning in the opportunity to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're watching tonight, uh, I like the way Dr. Bill Winston said, amen. If if you ain't saved, now's a good time to get saved. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, because salvation is a free gift that God gives, gives you. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. Amen. It's a free gift. Jesus secured it for you when he suffered and shed his blood on the cross for your sins. And all he said is come to me. That's all he wants you to do. Come to him. Amen. Come to him with, with an open heart. Don't come to him trying to hide, you know, I'm hiding my sins. You already know what you're dealing with anyway. So bring it to him. And come open and clean and just say, Lord, I need you. I want you in my life. Amen. And Jesus said, I will never reject you when you call upon me. But all he wants you to do is come to him. And if you would like to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to simply pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins 
and that you rose from the grave on the third day. Wash me with your blood and make me the person that you predestined for me to be. I denounce the world and I and I receive your plan for my life. Today, I am yours in Jesus name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. You're a child of the king. Your name has been recorded in the Lamb's book of life, according to Revelation chapter 13. I want to encourage you to get into a good church home. Amen. So that you can be surrounded by brothers and sisters in the faith that will keep you lifted up and keep you focused on the things of God. You need to have a support system and people that you can turn to talk to and pray with. Amen. And if you're looking for a good church home, then I definitely encourage you to check out our church ministry. We have some information at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen. You can go and, and look us up online or email us or give us a call. Amen. And inquire about being a part of our church family. And we would love to have you. Uh, but even if it's not our church, I want to encourage you to get into somebody's church, a good church. And by that, I mean one that teaches the word of God and believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not a dry dead place, but one that believes in surrendering to the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank the Lord. That's a good church. Amen. Get into a good church. <clears throat> and also, I want to encourage you, as we do each and every week, for those that are tuning in, if God moves upon your heart, amen, the word has been a blessing to you and it's definitely lifted and enlightened you. I certainly encourage you to sow, amen, sow a seed and sow, sow your uh, ministry gift, amen. And we do have different ways that you can give on the screen here as the Bible teaches. When you continue to sow, and to those that are teaching and ministering the word and so into the ministry, then God always causes it to come right back to you. Amen. Glory to God. He always causes it to come right back. So I certainly encourage you, amen, to be a blessing tonight and to sow your ministry uh, seed. Amen. Tonight. And again, the ways to give are on the screen. Until next week, may God continue to keep you and bless you. And may his face continue to smile upon you and his grace continue to just shine upon you. And I can't wait to come back again and finish this up as we continue to talk about casting down evil altars. Until then, God bless you.